Today we're going to be building this sort of console bookshelf piece that I'm calling Little Pico. And the reason I'm calling it Little Pico is because it's based off of a much larger piece called Pico. So Big Pico is something that we keep in the entryway of our house and we store our keys and shoes and mail and all that stuff in it. That said, you could also use it as a media console. And anyway, it's been really useful. So I wanted to build a stripped down version that requires fewer tools, less wood, and frankly, less time and experience to knock out. So all that said, I'm gonna cover everything that we're gonna do really thoroughly. So let's just get into it. All right, now everything that I do, you can adapt to your needs or whatever size you want, but I'm gonna cover everything specifically the way that I did it. So to build this, I'm gonna need one board of hardwood an inch thick, another board of hardwood three quarters of an inch thick, and enough three quarter inch plywood to yield three shelves. And in this image, you can see the minimum amount of material that I would purchase if I were starting with nothing. That said, in reality, I was using some leftover material from other projects to build mine. And because I'm using rough lumber, the first step was milling my material to the thicknesses that I just mentioned. And by the way, I'm using walnut hardwood and Baltic birch plywood, but obviously you could use anything that you like. And if you don't have a joiner and planer, you can start with wood that's already surfaced from your local lumber yard. Okay, so in order to make the side assemblies for this piece, which is definitely the most complex shape, we're gonna utilize some templates. So here you can see that I've got mine cut out of some half inch MDF. Uh, that said, we normally use quarter inch MDF for this, and this is something that we've covered a bunch of times in various videos. I'm gonna link a video right here where Sean covers it in a lot of detail. He goes over the entire process. You can basically print them out on paper and then shape it with some aggressive sanding and a few different pretty common tools within the shop. So finish watching this video and then if you do wanna build this, go check out that video because it lays it all out in way more detail than we could ever cover here. All that said, now we can proceed. All right, so at this point, the material for your side assemblies might be one big chunk of wood, or it could be random pieces like I have, and it doesn't really matter. At this point, you just want to have material that's about one inch thick, and we're going to use our templates to mark out roughly where we'll get our finished pieces from. And remember that we're going to need two of each of the three unique pieces that make up our assemblies. Then we just want to cut our material into oversized chunks. And you could use anything that you like to do this, whatever's the easiest. So that could be a table saw, a band saw, a jigsaw, a circular saw. It really doesn't matter. We just need oversized chunks at this point. And leave these chunks as oversized as possible for now, particularly the smallest of the pieces. The next step is that you need to have one nice flat edge on each of your roughed out chunks. And that flat edge is gonna correspond to the flat edges on our templates. Again here, you could use any number of tools to do this. If you have a joiner, that would work. A track saw is another great option. Basically, whatever gives you a flat reference edge will get the job done. Next, we'll use our templates to strike a line that represents where we're gonna cut our joint faces. So when doing this, make sure that your flat reference edge is flush with the flat edge of your template. Then to cut our joint faces, again, there's lots of options. If you've got a good miter saw setup, that would work. Or again, you could cut them using a track saw setup. But I'm gonna show how I do this with a plywood sled. So the first step is gonna be to get a chunk of plywood. And in this case, it's gonna need to be about 24 inches by 24 inches. And we're gonna start by locking down our table saw's fence and then just barely cutting one edge of the sled. And this is gonna be our cut line. And we don't wanna to touch our table saw's fence from this point on until we're done cutting our joint faces. And to do that, we're gonna start with the long piece of our assembly and flush up one of our joint faces with the cut line on our sled and clamp it down. And I'm gonna start with the shallower angle, which will become the top of our assembly, and you'll see why in a minute. Anyway, then we can use another piece of plywood to establish a fence that will hold our piece at the proper angle while we make the cut. So after making this cut on one edge of both pieces, we'll use our template to set up cutting the opposite end of the long piece. 
The only difference here is that now we need to add a stop block to the opposite end to ensure that both of these pieces come out to an identical length. Then with that set up, we can cut both pieces again. Next, we'll cut the joint faces on what's gonna become the top piece of the assembly. And the good news here is that you shouldn't need to change your setup because the angle of the bottom of the vertical piece and the angle on the top piece are the same. So we can just clamp that piece onto the sled and make the cut. And here you can see why leaving these pieces oversized at this point was a good idea so that we have some material to clamp to. Finally, we'll make one last setup to cut the joint face on the bottom of the piece and then we can move on. And this is just the same process. To assemble these, if you're planning on putting a decent amount of weight on your finished piece, it's probably a good idea to reinforce the joints with something like dowels or dominoes or biscuits or even pocket hole screws. Just note that if you do use pocket hole screws, you would be able to see these from the inside most likely, especially at the top joint here. So to help me position those, I'm gonna mark the eventual curve that I'm gonna cut onto the assemblies so that I can make sure that I don't place anything where it's gonna poke through an edge. And I'll use dominoes, but again, anything should be plenty strong. Then to get good clamping pressure, I'm gonna use the off-cut pieces from when we cut our joint faces glued onto the assembly so that my clamps don't wanna slide off as I apply pressure. That said, you could rig up any number of setups to achieve this, or even use specialty clamping blocks if you have them. I don't think you can buy these anymore, but here's a diagram that you can use to make some out of plywood. One thing to keep in mind is if you do use the wooden blocks glued on, you're going to need to clean those up after you've taken your assemblies out of the clamps. And speaking of that, let's let these dry and we can turn our attention to the other pieces of the build. I just ripped out all my scripts and I thought I was recording, but it turns out I just set the tripod up and then didn't hit record. So it would have looked like this, but it would have been cut material. It'd been like, Zzzz. Okay, so all you missed there was me ripping out three strips. One at three inches wide and another at one and a half inches wide and then another at two and a quarter inches wide. And these were all from my three quarter inch material and I'm just leaving them long at this point. Next, I'm gonna get a sheet of plywood and use my ACS to cut off the factory edge and then measure at 60 inches and set up a stop so that I can cut this chunk of plywood to that finished length along with my two longer strips of hardwood, which are the three inch wide piece and the one and a half inch wide piece. Then finally, I'll rip my plywood shelves to their finished width, which is gonna be 11 and three quarters of an inch wide. And this is optional, but I'm gonna tilt my blade to 15 inches when I make my last cut so that I end up with a bevel on the front edge of my shelves. All right, at this point, we can take our legs out of the clamps and get them cleaned up with a bit of rough sanding, and then we can remark our template shapes on if we erased them when we were sanding. Okay, so we're back and now we can start routing the final shape on it. So you can still see it all drawn right here. So the first thing we're actually gonna have to do is use the bandsaw to rough out the shape. And we'll just make sure that we stay to the outside of these lines right here. Can you see those? I don't even know if you can see those. And then we'll attach our templates with some double-sided tape. That way we can route out the final shape. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanna say. Um, I'll do it in the voiceover, it's easier. Okay, here I go. Okay, so with template routing, there's only a few tricks. First is that we're only gonna be template routing these edges. The outside edges don't need it, and the tips, since they're made from end grain, will tear out if we try to route them. So here I'm just using my template bit in my router to make a first pass, which is gonna establish a ledge. From there, we can remove the templates and use that ledge as the guide for our bearing to continue working our way down the piece. Then finally, for the last pass, when there's only a little bit left, we'll switch out the template bit for a flush trim bit and flip the whole thing over so that we can finish off the cut. 
Another optional workflow is that I like to float my router away from the cut where the joint faces meet, and then I use a spindle sander to clean up this extra little material. And this isn't necessary, but I just find that it helps to avoid tear out at these transitions. Next, I'm gonna get my plywood sled back out and reestablish a cut edge if needed, and then set it up so that I'm just barely trimming the top edge of my assemblies. And I'll make this cut on both of them. That way, if anything was slightly off in my glue up, now they're gonna become identical again. And you could pretty easily make this cut on a track saw if your table saw isn't big enough. Then finally, I'm gonna make a mark where I need to lop off the back ends of the assemblies and make that cut. And again, a track saw would work great or another setup on a sled is fine. All right, this next step is totally optional. And honestly, unless you feel very comfortable, I would recommend skipping this, but we're gonna put this little detail on our side assemblies. Again, it's optional and you could do nothing here or even just use a chamfer bit and a router to do something more similar to what we did on the full-sized Pico. That said, the way we're gonna do this detail is by using our plywood sled at the table saw again. Only this time I'm gonna establish a cut edge with my blade tilted to about 30 degrees. Then I'm gonna mark my piece by measuring a half of an inch from the outside face here and five inches away from the back side like this. Then I can set it up and get it clamped down on my sled, like you see here, and make the cut. Then to cut the other side, I'm gonna do the same thing, but since these are mirrors from one another, it requires two separate setups. Again, this is a pretty advanced technique, and it actually caused some other problems for me, so I'm showing you what I did, but basically saying, don't do this, not on this piece at least. I make the mistakes, so you don't have to. To assemble everything, we're gonna start by drilling some pocket holes on the underside of both long strips of our walnut. Then, and this is another option, I put a little bevel detail along the front top side of the one and a half inch strip. From there, we can use glue and pocket hole screws to attach the strips to our leg assemblies. And you want the top one flush with the top back side and the bottom one flush with the bottom back side and it was driving these screws that caused my piece to crack. It just got too thin and fragile at the back because of the detail, and thankfully, as you'll see in the finished piece, it cleaned up pretty nicely, but again, in hindsight, I would just forego this detail completely. Anyway, next we'll take our two and a quarter inch strip and place it on top of our bottom stretcher and mark a line where it hits the underside of the top stretcher. Then we can cut that to length and drill a few pocket holes and attach it with some screws. The next step is gonna be attaching the shelves. And again, here you could just use a pair of pocket hole screws through each shelf and into the leg assembly, and then another into the back support. But I like to add a little bit more support from the underside as well. So to do that, I'm gonna take a leftover piece of the walnut that I had and rip out a strip that's three quarters of an inch square and put a 15 degree bevel on it. That's optional. But anyway, you want this strip to be about 40 inches long so that you can cut out 12, roughly four inch long pieces. Next, we'll determine where we wanna position our shelves. So in this drawing, you can see how high the underside of them will eventually be. Then I'm gonna take a scrap piece of plywood and cut it to a length equal to my desired height minus the thickness of my bottom stretcher minus the thickness of my shelf support blocks. So in other words, desired height minus an inch and a half. So that means for our top shelf, we can cut our piece of plywood to 19 inches, then take it over to my assembly and set it on top of the bottom stretcher and use that to glue and clamp my first spacer block. With that one on, I can take an off cut piece of my bottom stretcher and place it on the ground to the inside of my leg, set my plywood spacer on that, and again, clamp on a support block. And we'll do this on both sides. From there, we can cut our piece of plywood down to 10 and a quarter inches to position our middle shelf. Then we'll do this one more time with our plywood spacer cut at an inch and a half for the bottom shelf. Once those are dry, I'm gonna use some blue tape on the side and a handsaw to cut away the extra material and then clean it up with some sanding. Finally, we can set our shelves in position, marking where they'll intersect with our legs, and then drill in a pair of pocket holes at each joint and attach them with some screws.
With those attached, next we'll flip the entire unit around and I'm gonna use some regular screws countersunk into the back and into the shelves. Then it's just a matter of sanding and applying whatever finish you like and we're done. All right, well, a few missteps aside, I'm pretty happy with the outcome. Again, I think this would make for a great place to keep the family's shoes or to use as a bookshelf or even a media console in a smaller room. So hopefully you learned something or maybe just got a few ideas from watching this video and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.